Welcome to our module on the issue of privacy. Uh, the name that we have for this module is Employees Privacy and the Management of Personal Information. This is a huge topic. It was one that was always important, but it has become dramatically more important um, with the increase in the ability that employers have to acquire information about employees and applicants and to retain that information for sometimes extensive periods of time. Uh, let me give you an example. When um, I began as a litigator doing employment litigation, uh, part of the uh, process that would, would happen during a case would be that we would as the employer, we would, we would give the uh, employee's attorney uh, personnel files, usually the employee's personnel file, oftentimes the manager's file, and perhaps some other employees who could be comparators with the um, employee. And so we might provide, I don't know, anywhere from say three to five personnel files. When I started in 1990, these would fill perhaps two banker's boxes. Um, uh, possibly three, but really probably one or two would be more likely. Nowadays, the amount of information that employers would have on just one employee would fill several banker's boxes. And um, the amount of data that you might actually exchange could easily fill a small room if you were to print up all of the pieces of paper, all of the data. And so we're really in a different world than we were even as recently as 30 years ago in this area. And as a result, uh, interesting opportunities arise because of this information and interesting problems arise. And so we're going to focus more on the problem side of, of the house, unfortunately, it's kind of the nature of our business, but um, just be aware that it's it's a mixed story, that there are some advantages and some disadvantages. Anyway, we're going to try to parse this area of the law out and find some ways that we can manage this information in a legally compliant manner. Okay, so in this module, we're going to do a general introduction. Then we're going to talk about the concept of reasonable expectation of privacy. I'm probably going to say this expression about 50 times. You're going to get a little sick of it, but it's really, really important. You know, when we talked, uh, when we were doing discrimination type claims, I probably said prima facie case about a million times. And the first few times, they probably didn't register with you as really important words, but by the end, you were sick to death of me talking about prima facie case uh, because it seems like whenever we turned a slide, there was another something about prima facie case. Um, and so uh, kind of like prima facie case is one of those foundational concepts in discrimination law, reasonable expectation of privacy is the same, it's, it, it means a different idea, but it's the same centrality in this practice area that we have with prima facie case. So uh, from the beginning, hopefully you'll latch onto this term and recognize that it's really, really uh, pervasive throughout this topic. Then we're going to, in a future lecture, talk about constitutional and statutory issues as well as common law issues. So these are kind of our buckets for discussing the legal authorities, the primary legal authorities that we're going to use. You can see constitution, statute, so the, a constitution can be a state or federal constitution. Um, and then statutes, these would be passed by a legislature, could be the federal legislature, could be a state legislature. And then common law ideas or ideas that have likely been with us for quite a while and that they have developed through case law. So they're kind of judge-made issues. And we'll explore each one of these topics. And then in a, in a later lecture, we'll talk about um, issues that are kind of somewhat unique or specialized in this field. For example, off-duty activities. How much in, uh, ability do employers have to control what employees do when they're not on the clock? Also about investigations and uh, employees' personal property. How are we going to interact as the employer, how are we going to interact with that personal personal property? What rights do we have? What responsibilities do we have under those circumstances? And then we're going to get to the big one, the really big one, and this is employee monitoring. This is a very, very a significant portion of the area that we see in privacy. I'm monitoring the use that the employee makes of the telephone, of the email, of computers, of um, medical records, of investigation materials, of things like polygraphs. There's all kinds of different ways this is developing and will continue to develop and evolve over time. So let's get started. We're going to just do a, the first two um, elements in this lecture and then we'll go on and cover the others in subsequent lectures. 
You will notice, by the way, as we go through this, that we don't have that one statute like we do with Title VII that kind of sums this all up and it's kind of the go-to place for most of the stuff that we've talked about. There is no statute like that in this area. Um, and so uh, we're going to be focusing more on common law in this particular uh, topic than we will probably any other resource, especially when we're talking about private employers in Texas. So the focus, the law is going to be a little bit different. And so it's good to have that in mind that we're really kind of entering a different category of law and we're going to approach the law in a bit different way. So let's talk about um, a workplace and a privacy uh, protections. And of course the issue is, is where does the line between what the employee uh, has entitled to keep a secret versus what the employer has the right to get in terms of information. And you can see the tension here. If I'm working, you know, I'm clocked in, supposed to be providing value for my employer, and I get a personal call, well, the employer has some interest in that. For one thing, it means if I'm taking a personal call, I'm not doing whatever the tasks are I'm supposed to be doing at work. But you can understand the employee's interest too. This is a personal call. This is something that uh, really has nothing to do with the employer and, and the employer's business needs. And so really the employer ought to chill and not focus on my call, where the employer is saying, I got to focus on it because these are minutes that you're not going to be productive. So there's that tension there. And what side you come out on favoring more privacy for the employee or more ability for the employer to manage um, is a value-laden choice and decision. There's not a right answer or a wrong answer. It turns on your particular perspective and viewpoint on these issues. If you work in HR or in a legal department, you need to know what your client's views are on these issues, where the line is. I mean, certainly the legal line is in some cases clear, sometimes it's not clear, but even assuming that your employer wants to stay on the legal side of that, there can be a range of answers. For example, an employer might well decide it would be legal for us to do X, but it's not part of our culture to do X. So we're gonna avoid that even though we can lawfully do that, we think. And so uh, where the employer or the client comes down is going to be a matter of the values of that organization. Um, and as you're working in that organization, you need to have a good sense as to what those values are. And of course, your job is not to impose your own values or make your own judgment as to where that line will be. Now, that's the role of the employer or the client. Now, of course, as you climb the ladder, uh, you may become one of the decision makers in your organization. Uh, maybe you'll be you know, the, the head HR uh, manager and therefore the CEO comes to you and says, well, what should we do in this area? I mean, you've told us what the law says, but what should we do? What is the right answer? And so as you climb up the ladder, you may well get to the point where you're able to say, look, these are our legal options. This is the option I recommend because I think it's most in keeping with our culture, or at least the culture we want to develop. But it's important always to make that distinction. So when you're making a decision, if you feel that you really do need to present your individual perspective, Many times that's okay, but you also have to, to pause and say, wait a second, this is my perspective. This is not what the law requires necessarily. This is not what our culture necessarily is currently requiring, but this is what I think we ought to be doing. And once you share that and the reasons for that, then you can move to, and this is what the law requires, and this is what our culture, uh, this is what our, our history of how we handle these situations. But having that clarity, that ability to say, my view, company policy, law, those are really three separate buckets. And you ought to keep that in your mind in this area and really all of the other areas that we've talked about. Okay, so let's go forward here. So what is privacy? Some people have defined privacy as the right to be left alone. I think that might have been something Greta Garbo said or something that's kind of a, a terse and pretty accurate way of describing what privacy is about. When we go through this chapter, we're gonna see that there's kind of two buckets that are really important. We have the government bucket and we have the private sector bucket. Up until this point, there haven't been a lot of differences between how a government employee is protected under these various statutes and how a private sector employee is protected. 
there's a few tweaks here and there, but for the most part, if uh, the government employees protected, the private sector employees probably pretty much protected in a similar way. If the private sector employees protected, probably the government employees protected in a pretty similar way. In this chapter, we're going to see some pretty stark differences. There's a great deal more protection for governmental employees than there are for private sector employees. Again, I'm not making a policy position about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or which is the better approach. I'm just saying that's the reality. And so as we go through this, I'm going to touch a little bit on governmental em employees and what the protections are for those folks. But this is, of course, primarily focused upon private sector employee employment. And so I'm going to do a deeper dive into the private sector stuff. Just be aware if you choose to be an HR person in uh, working for a governmental agency or you're representing um, a governmental agency in some kind of legal proceedings, that the answers are going to be pretty different. There's going to be significantly more restrictions on what that employer can do if it's a governmental employer. So let's just touch briefly on the idea of constitutional protections in this area. Um, one of the big cases, uh, I guess the first big case in the area of privacy constitutional rights was Griswold versus Connecticut. It's an important case in constitutional law. It is one of the bases for the Roe v. Wade decision that came down a little under a hundred, a little under ten years later. In this case, um, some married couples from the state of Connecticut sued the state of Connecticut because at that point the state of Connecticut did not permit the sale of birth control uh, devices even to married couples. And so the married couple sued and said, wait a second, state of Connecticut, uh, you are intruding upon our marital relationship and you really don't have any, uh, you, you aren't appropriately involved in these private decisions that we as a married couple might make about the size of our family. And so this, uh, the idea was this is a privacy zone. Well, the state of Connecticut said, well, no, we get to decide whether we birth control devices are, are, can be sold in the state of Connecticut. That is, you know, we think this law is constitutional. Um, and after all, there's nothing in the explicit words of the Constitution that talks about any right to privacy. Well, the married couples came back and said, well, yeah, you're right. There's nothing in the Constitution that actually uses the word privacy, but there are some portions of the Bill of Rights that talks about interests that are very analogous to privacy. For example, the right to be protected from unreasonable searches. Well, why do you want to be protected from unreasonable searches? You want to be protected because your privacy interest. Uh, the right that we have not to be required to quarter soldiers in our homes. Again, it's a right to kind of be left alone in our private space. So those types of protections found in the Bill of Rights clearly had a concern about privacy issues. And so that and other provisions led the Supreme Court in 1965 to hold that, yes, there was this, so it's called the penumbra the penumbra or the kind of the shadow of the Constitution creates this privacy right. And at this point, it was a rather narrow right. A married couple's uh, family planning choices was in the zone of privacy. Uh, it had nothing to do with single people's choices to um, engage in sexual conduct or to use birth control. It had nothing to do with abortion. It had nothing to do with same-sex issues. But this Griswold case ultimately led to Roe v. Wade. It led to Lawrence v. Texas, which is the case that um, prohibited uh, states from criminalizing consensual same-sex sexual behavior between consenting adults. So that is the idea behind the, the, the beginning part of this privacy right for the government. But of course, the Bill of Rights in the entire Constitution is about us being protected from the government. It's not about us being protected from private employers or from us being protected from each other. I mean, those might be valid concerns, but they're not concerns that are addressed in the Constitution. So as a result, uh, there's, there's no constitutional right that I have vis-a-vis -vis Walmart if I'm a Walmart employee. There's no constitutional right vis-a-vis -vis I have with, uh, with respect to my coworker or my su supervisor or my subordinate. 
um, unless, again, I'm working for a governmental entity. So the Griswold area of, of law really has to do with what can the government do to kind of, or what are the limits of the government's ability to intrude upon my private space. And it's not just the federal government, it could be the state or local government. And it's not necessarily restricted to what happens in my household or what happens, you know, in a sexual context. It could be lots and lots of other situations, which we'll explore as we go forward to this module. Of course, there's a balance here as we talked before. There are legitimate interests that employers have um, in things that an employee might consider private. And similarly, an employee has legitimate concerns about his or her privacy in areas that the employer might be interested in delving. And so there really is a balance, and this is very, very um, values driven. That's one of the reasons that we'll see pretty different answers as, as we cross between uh, public and private and when we go from one state to another because the particular balance that a particular state has decided is the right one for its particular moment in time may be very different than, the, than where another state might be. But the differences aren't just local or they aren't just within the United States. We see especially in Europe a great great concern about privacy ish issues and so if you happen to have a client or an employer that is international then you have to confront the possibilities that the EU or uh, other parts of the world in which you might have employees may have very different answers than what you might find in the United States. And then there can be additional issues about, well, even how you store data and how are you going to handle that storage and where you're going to store it and what you're going to be allowed to do with it. And so you might need to have very different processes for United States employees and employees in other uh, jurisdictions. So there's lots of complicated issues and some of them um, relate to uh, some IT issues. And one of the things I find uh, so interesting and sometimes so frustrating when we're talking about IT issues is that when you deal with IT professionals, many times their points of reference are so different than the HR slash legal mindset that it's sometimes difficult to even have a conversation. I've had conversations with IT professionals, people whom I respect greatly and who I think respected me, and I left those meetings sometimes thinking, okay, we, we really kind of solved the problem, we've drilled down and figured out what the answer is, and we've come up with some good approaches. And then the next meeting, I suddenly discover, oh my gosh, there's all this stuff I didn't even get, I didn't even understand. And it's not necessarily that, that IT professional was hiding stuff from me, um, he, I didn't know the right questions to ask to get the information that I needed. And he didn't know or she didn't know the type of information that I would want to get or that I would need to get. And so we were so far apart that we were thinking we were communicating, but in fact we weren't communicating. And an analogy that I would make is that when I was in college, I spent a summer in France. And I had had several years of French in high school and in college, and um, I could read French quite well at that time, not anymore, but quite well at the time. And I could speak it a little bit. Um, once I got to France, I would try to have conversations with people, and I could discover that I could order simple food in the restaurant, and I could, you know, figure out how to go places, but I could not discuss very subtle topics at all. Um, you know, it was, there's a book by David Sedaris called Me Talk Pretty. And that was kind of the way my French sounded, Me Talk Pretty. You know, it was a broken French. It was childlike French. It was very unsophisticated and unpolished. Well, when I talk IT, my IT isn't much better than my French was. And sometimes when those IT professionals talk, they're talking at such a high level, I'm only catching a portion of what they're saying. And I may think I'm understanding more than I really am. And when I flip to uh, attorney mode or HR professional mode, um, there can be that same disconnect that happens on the IT end of things. So it is a process when you are dealing with the IT folks. You may say, well, what do we care about the IT folks? Why do we need to communicate with them? Well, in many cases, they're the people who hold the data. 
And um, they may, so if I ask a question like, well, where do you hold personnel records? They probably have some very defined area where they hold the personnel records. But they don't realize when I ask that, I also want all of their um, health insurance claims forms. Oh, well, that's a completely different spot. But I just said I wanted all of the personnel records. Well, yeah, we have a file we call personnel records in this system, but you didn't say anything about needing medical records. Well, gosh, to me, medical records are part of the personnel file. Oh, no, we have different names for those. Well, when I asked for the personnel file, why didn't you say, well, there's another file that you might be interested in called medical records. And the IT person goes, it didn't occur to me. Uh, I, those are different things in my mind. And so you can see how there's that disconnect that happens. So it really requires being very careful and being very granular about this is the data that I need. Let me go through all the different types of data I think might be in here and let's talk through each one of them and then let's see if there's related files somewhere else that you might be aware of. And then just expect to have that conversation many times and expect the answer to evolve and grow and probably include more people in that conversation than you otherwise would think you would need because your IT person might know about four or five systems, but there might be several systems about which he or she is not an expert. And so if you've excluded people who are experts in those, those other systems from the meeting, you're not going to get all the data that you need. Um, I think hopefully you've gotten the idea already that employees do not have an absolute right to privacy in their workplace. This applies even to governmental employees. We have that idea of a balancing test, the competing interests of the employer versus the employee. And that's why we'll talk about that idea of a reasonable expectation of privacy. You can even hear in that term, reasonable is kind of balancing the competing interests, that type of idea. As I said before, we're also not going to be looking a lot at statutes. Up to this point, we've really been focusing on statutory law. There have been case law that have interpreted it, but the foundation we had a statute. And honestly, in, in the great portions of the law, great areas of the law um, in the United States, we don't have a statute. So it's not unusual to rely greatly upon judge-made law or common law. So uh, even though this section, this chapter is going to be somewhat different than the stuff that we've done to this point, it's um, not going to be uh, uh, different than what generally happens in the law by any means. Uh, as I said before, there's going to be a lot of variation between states. In fact, um, well, uh, we'll talk about even some state constitutions that address these issues. So sometimes, you know, we certainly have the federal constitution, which is really just going to relate to what the federal and state and local governments can do. But we'll see, especially with California, there are even some state constitutional provisions that get in the mix in these areas. Um, as we've already talked about the idea of, of employment at will, and that certainly exists in the private sector, exists in the private sector. And as you know, this is the right that employers have to dismiss their employees with or without notice, with or without cause, for any reason other than an unlawful reason. And there aren't a lot of unlawful reasons. We've been discussing them. We've been discussing the unlawful reasons for the past several weeks, but those are just a small category of, of the reasons that someone might be dismissed. And it's easy to start thinking, oh, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, because I keep on dwelling upon things you can't do. But honestly, outside of those little carved out areas, which are relatively discreet, relatively small, the employer has a great deal of latitude what he's going to do with his workforce. And of course, the idea of at will employment also applies to employees. Employees can quit their jobs whenever they want to, with or without notice, with or without cause, for any reason. And in fact, there is no caveat that says unlawful reason, because an employer always has employee always has the ability to leave uh, their place of employment. And so, this is an important organizing topic for all of our discussion about employee uh, and privacy issues. We will discuss again the, the common law protections. We have four of them in Texas, and I would say virtually all states have these four protections. And in fact, I talk in terms of there being four protections, but there's actually a few more that are kind of in that neighborhood of things that we want to think about. As I said just a second ago, California has a constitutional amendment, excuse me, not amendment, a, a part of its constitution gives um, employees in the state of California the right to privacy, and that extends to their personnel file, even if the personnel file is with a private employer. So if you happen to, at some point in your life, 
decide to practice law in California or to be an HR professional in California, you'll discover very quickly that the, many of the things that I've said this, in these lectures uh, are not completely true for California. Many times there's additional protections, additional rights, additional things to be aware of that the employer has to be uh, acting upon in that jurisdiction compared to uh, what the rules are in Texas and in most other states. We don't have anything like that in California, I mean in Texas. Uh, so there is no constitutional right to privacy in the private sector in the Texas state constitution. And in fact, there's nothing about privacy at all in the Texas state constitution other than the same types of rights that we find in the federal constitution. And those are really going to be limited to governmental employment. Okay, so we're done with our introduction. Now we're going to talk about that topic I promised you was going to be a recurring theme, that reasonable expectation of privacy. So let's begin. So what is a reasonable expectation of privacy? Well, when we see the word reasonable, hopefully we'll stop and think about this word, objective. In the law, reasonable and objective are like best friends. Let me write this up here. So um, let me give you an example. Um, imagine that I am Amish and I have a child and my child really uh, he's uh, 10 and he goes to school with non-Amish children and lots of the children in the um, a school where he attends um, have televisions at home, have uh, 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 cell phones, um, uh, you know, have all kinds of technological things, have, uh, you know, Wii's and, and Playstations and things like that at home. Um, he comes home, he says, boy, I'd, mom, I'd really like for us to get uh, a Wii or a PlayStation or a cell phone or something. I think that would be really cool. And I say, no, that's not uh, consistent with our religion. We believe in leaving a simple life, using as little technology as possible. So no, we won't be getting those things. Uh, we don't even have a landline because of our religious beliefs. We don't even use a car. We're definitely not getting those things. Um, our next door neighbors, we'll assume we, we don't live in kind of an Amish enclave, so we live next door to people who aren't Amish. Our next door neighbors um, are, are also nice, decent people. I like them a lot. Um, I appreciate them as neighbors. Uh, but they, gosh, they use technology all the time. They have uh, uh, a satellite dish on their house. They um, watch television. They have cell phones. They have um, uh, the uh, you know Wi-Fi connection, just you know, you name it, they have it in terms of technology. Um, you might say that both of us are reasonable, um, uh, but when we talk about reasonable legal context, we're not talking about is that person sane or is that person nice or is that person kind of logical and 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 uh, normal with their perspectives. That's not the standard. The standard has to be across the culture. And so while even though I'm an Amish person who I have somewhat unusual beliefs, I consider myself reasonable. My next door neighbor who I deal with frequently thinks of me as reasonable. But we've reached very different judgments about what the proper role of technology is going to be. I would say I'm not unreasonable, and he would say he is not unreasonable, but we've still reached different answers. So we can't look at the term reasonable and say, well, gosh, you know, everybody has different views, so it's kind of whatever a person thinks is, is, is good is what the standard is. No, that's not what we mean by reasonable. Reasonable in the law is an objective standard. You could look at it as kind of the average perspective. So if we were to go back in time to, um, say, 1950, uh, actually, let's go back to 1940 and say, is it uh, reasonable for people to have um, uh, uh, play devices that you hit buttons and there are screens in your house and it's interactive? Most people would have been like, what? 
what are you talking about? Never even heard of that before. I don't even think that's possible. No, no, that's not typical at all. I, I don't know what I think about that, but I definitely don't have that and don't know anybody who does have it. And so we would all react to the idea of a PlayStation game if we were living in 1950 with shock and amazement, maybe delight, maybe horror, but whatever it is, it wouldn't be mundane. It wouldn't be something that people were expecting. In you know the 2010s, though, our reaction is very different. We think, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty regular thing to have. A lot of people have it. Not everybody has it, but uh, you know, people have kids and they're reasonably comfortably financially, they're probably, you know, very likely going to have one of those. It's a very reasonable, logical choice to have. And so we kind of look at an average over time. This is going to change over time based upon technology, based upon cultural values, um, ideas that might have been considered shocking or not so reasonable or unusual might become more reasonable and vice versa can happen. So again, I think it's important to understand what we're getting at with reasonable. So it's, it's what the average person of ordinary intelligence who has typical life experience, how he or she would approach that. Now at the end of the day, how do we do come up with the answer to what's a reasonable expectation of privacy? Well, it ultimately comes down in many cases to what the 12 people on the jury thinks are, is reasonable. And of course, the bottom line is everybody or most people think they themselves are reasonable, right? I mean, it's the other guy who's unreasonable. I'm the reasonable person. And so in some sense, it does kind of become an average of those 12 people. And that is sort of their role. I mean, their role is to reflect that larger society. And, you know, sometimes the best juries are the ones that pull from different parts. They have people of differing ages, different genders, different races, different socioeconomic levels, different political views, maybe even different geographic experiences, rural, urban, suburban, all that kind of stuff. And so it is almost like a microcosm of the larger society. Anyway, that's one way of approaching this. So keep that in mind. Reasonable isn't just what an individual thinks about a situation. It's that average, and it's going to be a moving target. And it's a very key term for uh, both the government employee and the private sector employee. So when the employer is thinking through what it wants to do about privacy issues, one of the things that it needs to do is communicate with employees. Because if it's not telling employees what it plans to do, then it may be setting up all kinds of expectations and beliefs on the part of employees that are just not true. And that has a lot of potential for problems. I mean, one thing is it can cause a lot of unhappiness within the department or the within the unit. The employee thinks he's getting this level of protection, very high, we'll say, and in fact, he's getting a very low level of protection. If that becomes revealed, then there could be lots of employees who are angry. Or it could be a situation where the employee doesn't really know where the line is, and so he or she is experiencing some level of anxiety. You know, are there cameras when I go to the bathroom? Um, are there uh, cameras monitoring me in my workstation? I don't know. I'm anxious. I, I, I would like to know one way or the other, and I don't, and that causes me anxiety. And so sharing information can uh, address morale issues. It can also increase compliance. Uh, if an employee knows he's being monitored in his workstation, he's probably less likely to look at porn, right? Um, if he knows that when he clocks in, um, that time is being noted, um, you know, in the clock in reader, then he's more likely to make sure he clocks in on time. Uh, so those are just kind of common sense differences. But there's, there's a third reason that we do want to um, really communicate with employees. The first two are important, but the third is, is from a legal standpoint, the most important. And that is when we tell an employee, hey, listen, this is what we're going to do. The employee can't later claim, I didn't know. He knew. He may not remember. He may not have been paying attention, but he had the ability to know. And once somebody knows there's being monitored, for the most part, they no longer have a reasonable expectation of privacy. For example, if, if my next door neighbor tells me, listen, uh, you leave your blinds open in your bedroom, and when I'm making my cup of coffee in the morning, the guy kitchen window looks directly into your bedroom. And so 
you know, if you were changing clothes, then I'd be able to see you. So you might want to close your blinds. So I know this. He's told this to me. The next day I get up at 7 a.m. and I leave my blinds open and I change clothes. Um, I'm getting my mail a couple of days later. He says, you know what? I was making my coffee the other morning and I saw you without your clothes on because you were changing clothes right inside of the window that was open or that didn't have the blinds drawn. I can't very well say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you saw that because I knew that that was a real possibility because he told me it was a real possibility. I had no reasonable expectation of privacy because he told me I didn't. Once the employer tells the employee, uh, we're not doing that or we're doing this, then the employee can't really, for the most part, legally complain. This is especially a private sector employee cannot really complain. Oh, well, you told me you were going to monitor my emails, but when you actually did monitor my emails, I didn't like it very much, and so I'm mad about it. Well, you can be mad about it, but you can't really assert a privacy right because you knew it wasn't private. So by establishing the privacy policies and communicating it to the employees, the employee who chooses to continue under those circumstances is, is, is essentially waiving the right to privacy with respect to the email. So if I know that my employer is going to uh, view emails um, and um, I continue to look at personal emails at work, then I'm doing it with the understanding that my employer may well be seeing that email that I just opened. And if I don't want him to see it, I probably shouldn't be looking at it at work. So let's consider the topic of reasonable areas in which we might expect some privacy. Some of these are really commonsensical. For example, if, if I am at work, I would expect privacy with respect to my bodily integrity. I would not expect people to grope me at work. I would not expect people to, you know, have a special kind of glasses that could look underneath my clothes and see what I look like without my clothes on. I would expect to be able to go to the ladies' room or the men's room or, or wherever to, to take care of bodily functions and not to have cameras present in that. If there's a workout room or a dressing room, I would expect to be able to change clothes and shower there in a private place, again, without having anybody monitoring me. All of those are things that would be a reasonable expectation of privacy. Another would be um, private parts of my uh, or kind of extensions of myself. For example, my briefcase and my purse. In many cases, we'll say that we have a right of privacy with respect to those. Um, when I was at JCPenney, it was common for units to um, give their stylist a see-through bag. that They would give the stylist a locker with a key. Typically, the employer would keep the key and, but, or a combination of the combination, but also give the employee a key. The employee could store his or her, you know, wallet or briefcase or purse um, in that central place, say in a break room, and then go to work and work um, uh, doing hair or nails or whatever the particular specialty was. But uh, he or she might well want to have some supplies for that task. For example, he or she might have a blow dryer or a curling iron or some uh, combs or scissors. In fact, those are usually owned by the, the stylist. They aren't kind of uh, given out to the stylist. And so he or she very likely would want to keep track of those. So they would carry their little satchel or, or bag full of stuff to and from, but the bag would be see-through. So they would have no reasonable expectation of privacy under those circumstances. Everybody could see what's in there. Oh, I see you've got a curling iron in there. Oh, that's my curling iron. Why are you taking my curling iron? Or, oh, I see you have the blow dryer. Wait a second, that's not your blow dryer. That belongs to the employer. So you wouldn't have had any expectation of privacy in that situation. On the other hand, in units where employees were allowed to bring purses or briefcases or their own personal satchel to the work area, um, then if they were leaving the work area, um, the employer really wouldn't have a, a, a as, certainly as clean a basis for saying, well, can I look in that? Can I make sure there's nothing that belongs to either another employee or to the employer before you leave? Because again, that person, since it's his own stuff or her own stuff, 
might well have a reasonable expectation of privacy, especially if the employer does not routinely do checks and or hasn't told employees that they would routinely do checks. There's a case in this area that's kind of important in Texas, and that is the Trotty case, Walmart versus Trotty. I'm going to just show this to you in a second, or for a second. Here we go. This is available to everyone. I think I've posted it within our, our uh, module, uh, but you just go to Google Scholar and type in Trotty, T-R-O-T-T-I. In this case, Ms. Trotty was an employee of Kmart, and Kmart um, offered its employees lockers. Uh, they were uh, lockers, I think, that had combination locks on it. Uh, Kmart provided some with combinations, and so Kmart knew the combination and would give the combination to the employee, but apparently they ran out of combination locks, so employees who wanted to keep their purses and other stuff safe would go out and buy their own combination lock, and they were not required to share the combination with Kmart. So that's what Miss Trotty did. She bought a combination lock, and she put it on her locker that Kmart provided. Clearly, Kmart had purchased the locker, but Miss Trotty had purchased the lock, and the stuff inside the locker, Mrs. Trotty had actually purchased. They were her stuff. And in fact, she had her purse in there, as well as, I think, some other items. She uh, went to work one day. She put her stuff in the locker. She uh, put the combination lock on it. She sealed it. She went to work. And then at the end of the day, she, op she went back to her locker. The locker was no longer locked. Since she was the only one who had the combination, she was quite surprised by this. Um, I'm not exactly sure how Kmart opened it without, I don't know, maybe they did damage the lock. I'm not quite sure that part. Then Ms. Trotty went into her purse and she feels that, that the items in her purse had been disarranged, that they, while nothing was missing, uh, things that had been in one compartment were in another compartment or they were just helter-skelter. And so she felt confident that somebody had gone into her purse. Eventually, she finds out from the management that in fact they had thought that there there was a, a thief amongst the employees and so they had gone through people's bags. They had not suspected Miss Trotty of theft and in fact there was nothing that turned up that would indicate she was involved in any theft. They just decided to kind of check everybody's locker at that time. And Ms. Trotty sued alleging invasion of privacy and uh, she was successful. She got, I believe, $8,000 in actual damages, and she got, I think, $100,000 in punitive damages. Keeping in mind, this is a while ago. This is 84, or so when the actual verdict came down, it was probably in 19, or actually, the event happened in 1981. So um, quite a while ago, you probably would see a bigger verdict than this now. Also keep in mind, this is a private employer. Obviously, Kmart isn't part of the government. So Ms. Trotty was able to persuade the jury that she had a reasonable expectation of privacy in a locker where she was the only person that had the combination lock and where the eye that was in the locker was her purse that wasn't obviously see-through and that obviously contained her personal effects. So you definitely can win in these claims, even in Texas, even when you are employed by a private entity. So let's consider the Vega Rodriguez case. This is from California, excuse me, from Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico, strangely, is from is part of the First Circuit. The First Circuit includes Puerto Rico and New York and a few states up there. So uh, strangely, Puerto Rico is not part of the 11th Circuit, which is where Florida is. And you would think, given the proximity, that it would be part. But no, it's not. So um, anyway, the issue in this case is, does continuous video surveillance contravening the right of the people to be secure in their persons against unreasonable searches. So this has to do with the Puerto Rico Telephone Company. In this particular location in Puerto Rico, the telephone company is a utility. And that's a pretty common situation, especially um, in the past, probably a little bit more so than today. Um, and so because it's a quasi-governmental entity, constitutional issues such as searches and seizures uh, can be relevant to how these cases get resolved. So the issue is, in this particular work area, there were video surveillance cameras that monitored all of the employees' tasks throughout their working day. 
as you can imagine, that's not the most confident thing to or comfortable thing to have happen. I mean, every time you sneeze, somebody's looking at you. Every time you blow your nose, somebody's looking at you, or at least potentially somebody's looking at you on the video. These, um, this uh, office configuration was, was open, and so it wasn't just that the video camera was seeing employees, but they would see each other doing the tasks throughout the day. And this was well known. The, the management told the employees that we had that they had these video cameras. Well, anyway, uh, Miss Vega Rodriguez uh, sued about this. She said this was an unreasonable search. I mean, I've done nothing wrong. My coworkers have done nothing wrong. We are being searched in violation of the Fourth Amendment. So again, it's because this is a quasi-governmental entity that we even care about the Fourth Amendment. And the court said no. Kind of for the same reasons that Ms. Vega Rodriguez was offended by the process were the same reasons that she was kind of guaranteed to lose. She knew. She knew the cameras were on her, so she had no reasonable expectation of privacy because why would you feel like you're in a private place when you know cameras are looking at you? Plus, uh, you know, the, the person in the next office can look at you, so how is that different than somebody on a camera looking at you? Um, it's the same idea. And so the court held that no, there is no uh, protection from continuous surveillance um, in, under those circumstances. So um, let's go to our next slide. So as we talked about before, privacy may be protected via constitution. Again, we can have the federal or the state constitution, or we can have federal statutes or state statutes. And then we can have common law principles. There are no federal common law principles, but we do have those state by state. In many states, you'll see a lot of commonality because, of course, the common law developed in Great Britain and then it kind of was distributed to the colonies and eventually throughout the United States. Um, but there will be some subtle and sometimes not so subtle differences between the answers that we see in uh, one state versus another state. An important idea, especially when we're talking about the Constitution, is whether a right is a fundamental right, uh, kind of a, a starting point right, one that really points to uh, something that has to, that, that says something uh, important about the human condition, about how we, sh um, how we ought to interact with others. Many times this idea is kind of bundled up with the idea of natural law, that there's certain basic truths about human beings. And one of those truths you could say is that we like privacy. We like to have our own zone. Um, if you've ever seen a, a, a group of puppies that have been uh, born, or that, and I, we were at the, the state fair, fair not too long ago, we saw these, these baby piglets. And they just lay on top of each other. They have no sense of personal space. Um, it was perfectly fine for them to all just kind of be one big writhing, you know, cute little lump of, of furriness. Um, and so, you know, they don't really have a feeling that they need some privacy. Um, probably babies don't have any kind of sense of privacy. Uh, but as we get older, it's kind of inherent to the human condition that we need to have some opportunities to retreat. So you might call this a fundamental right. Um, and so that kind of colors the, the whole topic of privacy law. So at this point, we've covered an introduction and we've started the discussion about the reasonable expectation of privacy. In our next lecture, we'll discuss some of these uh, legal uh, sources of authority or, or protection for privacy, constitutional, statutory, and common law. As always, I thank you for your attention. If you have questions, don't please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My um, email is cgroover at colin.edu. Or better yet, come by my office hours and we can talk in more detail. I'd be glad to uh, hear what your thoughts are and share with you uh, what I know about the law in this area. Again, thanks so much and have a wonderful day.